begin by praying. Lord God, we thank you that you are a God of love and not only a God who loves, but a God who is love. And we thank you for the difference that makes. And so as we think about it and look into your word tonight, I pray that you'd speak into our hearts and lives and that we would experience that love and be able to pass it on. Jesus, we ask this in your name. Amen. 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 Right. Um, we're doing a review of the chapter on God is Love by um, Packer. And it starts off with looking at what we mean when we say God is love. And I think one of the the pitfalls is that so often the idea that God is love is held up as an excuse of why people shouldn't be allowed to do things or shouldn't do things. Um, and uh, therefore, we, one thing, we do not have um, uh, people speaking about the justice of God. And you can't talk about the judgment of God. And you say, oh, but, but to, how, how can you possibly believe in, in a hell because God is love? And what it ends up with is, is that because of the way people understand God as being God of love, there is no limit, there's no boundary, everybody's included, there, there can't be any justice ultimately because everybody's just loved by God and it becomes a big, um, as Jerry said on Sunday, a big Father Christmas kind of mushy um, unstructured love and instead uh, God's love is a is a the love of a parent and the love of a parent to a child is not a permissive love it doesn't just let the child do what whatever the child wants because that's not loving and, and very often discipline and restrictions and putting boundaries in place and holding children accountable and um, punishing them when necessary um, is all an expression of love and it's that kind of love that um, we're talking about when we say that God is love. And so we, uh, 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 Packer refers us back to the scriptures and says um, in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, we read, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. And he then looks at what does it mean when God this God of love pours out his love into our heart. And there are a couple of things that comes out. And the one is the word he has poured out. So the word that they use for the outpouring of the spirit. And it's not sort of a gentle pouring from a, uh, a little a milk jug at a tea party. It's more like pouring out of a bucket onto a fire kind of uh, pouring. Uh, and that's how God pours out his love um, into our hearts. And the second point he makes is that the tense, it's the perfect tense of the verb. So it's not God is pouring or God will pour, but it, it, it God has poured. It's a, it's a perfect tense, which implies a settled state after a completed action. So that this has happened and the, everything is different because of that. God has poured. Um, his love into our hearts. And as Christians, we have God's love within us. That is what it means to be a Christian. And the third point he, he makes is he's poured it into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And uh, Packer points out that this is one of the, the prime uh, gifts that the Spirit gives us is the love of God. He fills us with the love of God. Um, and there's some uh, measure in which people have got sidetracked in uh, parts of the, the church where uh, people are charismatic and Pentecostal. And in a sense, people have thought, oh, if you've got a, a somebody who's got a gift of speaking in tongues or the gift of prophecy or one of those other gifts, that's a special thing. But they say, no, you, you want to see people that have the love of God because that's the primary um, work of the Spirit, pouring God's love into our heart. Uh, 
And so um, if that's what God does, that's what we look for when we're praying for revival from God. And I just want to read a bit of a passage from Packer um, where he says, revival means the work of God restoring us. Um, sorry. Revival means the work of God restoring to a moribund church in a manner out of the ordinary, whose standards of Christian life and experience, which the New Testament sets forth as being entirely ordinary, and a right-minded concern for revival will express itself not in a hankering after tongues. Ultimately, it is of no importance whether we speak in tongues or not, but rather in a longing that the Spirit may shed God's love abroad in our hearts with greater power. For or it is with um, this to which deep exercise of soul about sin is often complementary. That personal revival begins. And by this, that revival in the church, once begun, is sustained. So really saying we pray that God would deepen our love for him and his love for us. So what does, what does God's love look like? Because um, as is so often the case, uh, it's easy to talk about love and there are innumerable films and TV shows which talk about love and how, what that looks like. Um, and often the way they view love can be quite different and sometimes contradictory to one another. Um, and when we're talking about God, we're talking about God who is love, not just experiences love or expresses love, but is love. And in that way, he's completely different to all people because none of us is love. We might love, we might experience love, but we aren't in our nature love. And so what does this look like when you're talking about God? And Becca says that God is love is not the complete truth about God, as far as the Bible is concerned. And he says, it is not an abstract definition which stands alone, but a summing up from the believer's standpoint of what the whole revelation set forth in scripture tells us about its author. And so as you read the Bible from Genesis right through, you see what God being love is um, and how that expresses itself. And he makes another comment, a little paragraph further on. It is perverse to quote John's statement, as some do, as if it called into question the biblical witness to the severity of God's justice. It is not possible to argue that a God who is love cannot be a God who condemns and punishes the disobedient, for it is precisely of the God who does these very things that John is speaking when he speaks of God being love. And so God um, is love in a way which um, reflects the whole of scripture. And he goes on to three aspects of um, truths about God, which we need to bear in mind. And the one he says is um, God is spirit, not God is a spirit. But God is spirit, um, and that is taught by Jesus, and therefore he can be um, everywhere and different to our experience of him. He says God is light, um, and that again in um, John uh, 1 John 1 is reported as having been taught by Jesus that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And the third point is that God is love. And so it's not just the one or the other, it's all three together. Um, and what that means for us um, is uh, that uh, the spirit means he is free from any kind of limitation. He can be with us at all places, at all times, um, that he, he doesn't change as we do. He doesn't have... Um, uh, bad experiences 
dealings which affect his dealings with us because he's perfect he is completely in control um, in all that he does and to say that god is light um, is to imply that god's holiness finds expression in everything he says and does and uh, light is put up against darkness um, and god can only be light and there's no space for darkness in him uh, and when we then think of God as love, it means that there has to be this perfection in God and in how he loves and in what is required from us. Um, again, let me quote from Packer uh, when he talks about God working as love. Um, in us, he says, uh, not God is, it's not just in some things that God is love, but in all things that God shows his love to us. And he says, every single thing that happens to us expresses God's love to us and comes to us for the furthering of God's purpose for us. Thus, so far as we are concerned, God is love to us, holy, omnipotent love, at every moment and in every event of every day's life. Even when we cannot see the why and the wherefore of God's dealings, we know that there is love in and behind them. And so we can rejoice always, even when, humanly speaking, things are going wrong. We know that the true story of our life, when known, will prove to be, as the hymn says, mercy from first to last, and we are content. And that is a uh, great passage to read, very encouraging, but very difficult to live by it, especially when you're going through times that are difficult. And so we talk about defining God's love. And Packer says, God's love is the essence of his goodness towards individual sinners, whereby having identified himself with their welfare, he has given his son to be their savior and now brings them to know and enjoy him in a covenant relation. And then he fleshes out that um, definition by pointing out um, and these are the main points in the section that God's love is an exercise of his goodness. Um, that because God is good, he loves and his love is also good in everything. And the second point he makes is God's love is an exercise of goodness towards sinners. Um, and while love can often be reciprocal and we love because uh, somebody has loved us, that is not what God's love is like. God's love is entirely, um, in a sense, one-sided. We cannot earn it. We do not deserve it, but we receive it. Um, and that is God's love towards sinners. And it's the kind of thing that um, when we come across sinners, um, who we would define as sinners because while we're all sinners, we're there, we're, there are some people that we look down on more than on others, and we seldom we look down, down on ourselves. But those sinners that we, we think are much worse than us, we would find it almost impossible to love, and very often we'll justify not loving and not showing love to them. Um, and yet God um, never treats any sinner in that way. And Becker makes a, the... The comment, it is staggering that God should love sinners, yet it is true. And sometimes we forget that and we get so used to the idea that God is love and he loves us and he loves all the people around about us um, that we forget just how um, strange and unusual and different that is. The third point he makes is that God's love is an exercise of his goodness toward individual sinners, that it's not just a a love to people in general, or to every the whole of creation, but he loves individual people, and he loves people like you 
and like me. And part of what he's doing is he's calling each person to respond to that love. And he offers his hand and says, um, come and follow me. And some people accept it um, and become the objects of his love. And some people will turn away. Um, and because God is love and God, uh, that love will be respecting, he doesn't overwhelm or overrule people's individual choices. Um, and so if he were to ignore what we wanted and just force us into a, a, a relationship, that would change the nature of his love. Instead, he, he invites us, he, he pleads with us, he opens his arm toward us, and how we respond is up to us. And he then treats us in the way that our response asks. Um, and so there are some people that will remain outside of his love, not because he doesn't love them, but because they've chosen to be there. Um, and there's some of us that will choose to be inside his love and we will have his love poured into our hearts by the spirit um, because he loves us individually. Um, and we need to remember that everybody we know, all the people around about us, are, um, God loves them as individuals and he's calling them. And we need to sometimes point us out to them and share with them that, that God loves them. He then makes a point, God's love to sinners involves his identifying himself with their welfare. Um, And in most love relationships, um, he points out uh, that um, to be in a love relationship, we know that those who truly love and are only happy when those whom they love are truly happy also. Um, and he says a parent cannot say they truly love their child when their child is desperately unhappy. And as so many people have pointed out, you're only ever as happy as your unhappiest child. Um, and uh, that is true for us, and it's true for God as well. Uh, and uh, God seeks our happiness because our happiness um, is, he identifies with our welfare, and when we are happy, that brings joy to him as well. Um, there's a quote. Um, on page 125 of my book, which I just want to uh, read. Uh, God was happy without humans before they were made. He would have continued to be happy had he simply destroyed them after they'd sinned. But as it is, he has set his love upon particular sinners. And this means that by his own free voluntary choice, he, he will not know perfect and unmixed happiness again till he has brought every one of them to heaven. He has, in effect, resolved that henceforth for all eternity, his happiness shall be conditional upon ours. And that is a, a, a statement which uh, bears a bit of pondering that... Uh, um, God's love is that involved with us. It's not kind of loving at a distance and offering us um, sweets through the windows of a car kind of thing, but actually involved in our life and drawing us in. And he's that invested in his love for us. And the fifth point he makes is God's love to sinners was expressed by the gift of his son to be their savior. Um, that he pours his son uh, he gives his son freely um, so that we can be drawn into his love. He gives his son to do what we cannot do. And where we had been cut off and isolated, his son comes and does that um, and restores our relationship with him. And so as Paul says in Romans 5.5, 5, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Um, and we need to remember that Christ is um, part of the um, 
the Godhead and the God the Father and God the Son are one. And so it's not as though God the Father set, deputized the Son and sent him off um, independently to deal with it and he uh, visited judgment upon him on the cross. Um, the Father and the Son are one. They are one with one another. And so as Christ uh, demonstrated his love, this was God, the whole of the Godhead, demonstrating their love. Um, and part of that, the teaching of the Trinity, which we, we struggle to, to get our heads around, but that um, the full nature of God is in each part of the Trinity. It's not that Jesus is only a part of God, one third of God. Jesus is completely God, even though he's distinct from the Father and the Son. Likewise, the Father, I mean, the Father and the Spirit, likewise, the Father and the Spirit um, are distinct from one another, but they are all fully God. And so when Jesus came, this was God um, coming himself to offer a sacrifice for our sins. The sixth point you make is God's love to sinners reaches its objective um, as it brings them to know and enjoy him in a covenant relation. And uh, I'm not quite sure whether if uh, Paul and people who are writing today, if they would use a different a bit of language for covenant or whether they'd use the term covenant, uh, because covenant is now quite foreign to um, to most of our life and there's more people think more in terms of legal agreements or, or um, treaties and things like that where there's a, a binding agreement between people with responsibilities on both sides and undertakings of, of what they will do um, but biblically they God speaks of a covenant um, and through the scriptures you see a number of covenants that God has made uh, the initial covenant was with the creation, um, which was then spoiled, and he made a covenant with Abraham. Um, he then made a covenant with the people of Israel as he brought them out of Egypt. And um, there are a number of covenants, and Jesus comes and says he's come to, to bring a new covenant um, in his blood. And a covenant is that kind of deep, personal, costly commitment that one makes there where um, flowing out of love and respect um, for one another. There are promises made and undertakings given that will hold good. And one thinks, and they point out the example of a marriage, um, and certainly not all marriages work out that way, but the ideal of a marriage of, of uh, husband and wife saying, I give myself to you completely and wholly till death us do part. This is going to be shape our lives, shape who we are, shape what we do. It's going to, in a sense, limit what we are, what we can do because I'm committing myself to you and forsaking all others. And so in a sense, it, it binds us. But at the same time, it is an expression of love and a source of great joy and blessing. Um, and that is all um, in our anticipation in the relationship. And God makes a covenant with us, a covenant of love, um, which is the kind of long-term, deep, deep commitment that he has made to us. And so we have this overview of a God who is love. I want to then look at the scriptures. Let's look at John, the first letter of John, John chapter 4. And reading from verse 7, where John speaks about God as love um, and what that means for us and how we respond in love to him. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to 1 John chapter 4. And we can read that together. And I'll make a couple of comments as we go through and as we read, just notice uh, where John speaks about love. Uh, right, verse seven, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of 
God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And we need to remember that when he's speaking about um, everyone who loves is born of God, this is not talking about Romeo and Juliet. This is talking about people that are loving with a Christian love, with the kind of deep commitment um, and uh, compassion that uh, should be part of uh, all Christian relationships. We talk about the agape love and this godly love that is part of the Christian life. And because God is love, that love flows into our, into our lives and from our lives flows to one another. Verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Again, making the statement of how God shows his love. That, that this love has a practical um, outworking. It's not that God sits at a distance, proclaims his love, and then keeps away. This is an active engagement um, with us. Um, and it just prompts me to think of what is our active engagement with God if we say we love God. Verse 10, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Um, and we need to remember that it is God loving that makes all of life possible. It is God's love that makes our um, Christianity possible. And people sometimes think that everyone in the world is going searching, searching, and will eventually find God. Um, scripture says differently. People might be searching, but they wouldn't be searching in the right place. Um, people might be searching, but 90% of people would not be enamored by what they find if they do find God. But what happens is God initiates, God shows his love. And it's not that we love God, but that God loved us um, sacrificially, perfectly by sending his son. Verse 11, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Um, and one's reminded where um, James says, if you claim to love God, but don't love other people, we question whether you love God in the first place. Um, and if you say, oh, I love God, um, let me show you my love by how I treat other people. And that is what John says. If God loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Um, and I wonder how many people see God when they look at Christians and they look at the church and how many people see the way Christians so often behave and the kind of factions that there are in church and the the people trying to get one up on one another and uh, uh, working for power in their own self-interest within the church context. And that just speaks completely the opposite of a God of love. Um, and we, if we don't show love, we do not have um, God in our midst um, and we've got nothing to offer the world. Verse 13. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Uh, really just saying that so much of faith hinges around our understanding in our perception of Jesus as the son of God. Um, and the minute you start watering that down, you, you lose the, the essence of the faith because if Jesus is just another son of God and we're all sons of God, um, as the Mormons would have us believe, 
then there's no way that his self-offering can in any way be vicarious. He cannot do that on behalf of anyone other than himself. And we're sitting with our sins and we have no hope. Um, and so our understanding of who Christ is as the only son of God, um, as God incarnate, um, is vital for our theology and for our understanding and for our salvation. And we know and rely on the love God has for us, which we see in Jesus. He continues, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And, and what uh, John is saying is that if we are in Christ, if we know the love of God, if God has indeed shed his love abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, um, we have no fear in the face of eternity. And it's one of the, the strengths of being a Christian when we face death, as we all will, that we can face death with confidence and know that there is a loving father waiting for us. Uh, we have a brother who said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Um, and therefore, that perfect love of God for us casts out any fear that would be, would be innate in people contemplating our mortality and eternity. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Um, and I think that is an important point that we need to remember. And so often I see people organizing programs and wanting to do a whole lot of good and they're wanting to, well, let's go out and um, organize for people to build homes for the homeless, which can be done. Uh, but ultimately, it is unsustainable unless the people that are doing it first um, are in relationship with God. If they know how much that they have been loved, then they are able to reach out in love to other people. Um, and as a church, rather than inspiring people to go out and do social action, we need to draw people in to know the love of God so that they then don't go out and do, do social action, but they then go out and love because they have first received the love of God and know that they are loved and that they have got this love to share with the world. And it's interesting that the, the people that have made a huge difference in the world, and there are people that have gone out as missionaries, there are people um, like, uh, um, what's his name, Miller, who started the first orphanages in, in England, did that not because they saw the need, but because they knew God um, and were passionate about God, and that then changed how they saw the need and what they did. So we love because he first loved us. And if God loves us, that has to translate into how we treat other people. John continues, whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they've not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. And as John says that, he's probably uh, has in the back of his mind Jesus responding to the question by the teacher of the law. Where he says, what are the greatest commands? And Jesus responds, the first is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And so John is saying, if we claim that we love God, that will show itself in our love for other people. And so as Christians, we have a God 
who is love um, and who loves us because he is love. And he calls us to walk with him and he shapes us so that we can become more loving day by day. Right. Were there any questions or comments before we go into our groups? Right, some questions that you can take into your groups. Um, and if your group is like our group, or like most groups I've been a part of, you'll probably actually get around to answering one of the questions. And it might be any one of them. And your discussion will, will range and vary. Um, but that is absolutely fine. We're asking you to think of the love of God. And if the discussion of the love of God leads you in a certain direction, it's not, not a panic. We're not going to, this isn't a test that you have to answer all four questions and I'm going to get marked on. It really is to, to think through in a personal, in our personal way, what does the love of God mean for me, for you in our lives today? And so in the group, please also just allow everyone to have a chance to, to speak um, and uh, say what you'd like to say, but yeah. Uh, keep it fairly brief so that there is opportunity for other people to speak as well. Questions to think about as you go into your groups. Um, if you're to be asked about, Bible says God is love, what does that mean in your own words? Um, in your own words, what does it mean God is love? And secondly, in your own experience, what does that mean? Do you have some kind of experience um, or thing that you can point to in your life which speaks to the love of God? The second question to think through um, where Packer says uh, that God has... That all that God does is an expression of his love and everything that happens in our life is part of that love of God. An easy thing to say, but how do you actually process that when you're in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death? Um, or when you are in a jail, um, chained to a wall, having been beaten by the Philippian authorities. Um, earlier that day, as Paul experienced. It's all very well to say, oh, God's love is working itself out, um, but it's not an easy thing to do. Another question, possibly you might not end up discussing it in the group, but I think it's worth considering and thinking about individually. Where in your life has God's love not had its full effect? Um, what part of your life would God's love want to change more? Where have you held back? Where have you possibly gone astray? And what will you pray for? And then a final thought which you can take into discussion at the end of the chapter uh, Packer writes, John wrote that God is love in order to make an ethical point. Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Could an observer learn from the, the equality and degree of love that I show to others, my wife, my husband, my family, my neighbor, people at church, people at work, anything at all about the greatness of God's love to me? And again, that might be a challenge to think through and mull through and pray over rather than necessarily discuss in the group. But if you have the book, go and read that, that last paragraph in the chapter and think, how is our expression and the way we treat other people 
would that convince people of the love of God? So uh, in your own words, what is the love of God? In your own experience, what is the love of God? And how do you cope in suffering? Thinking of that that too is part of God's love for us. Right, we will go to the groups. And I'm afraid I've waffled on a bit, it looks like. Uh, we've got to about 25 minutes for discussion. And we will come back to the group together at quarter past eight. That's so just on 10 to, we'll come back together at quarter past I for close. One of the, one of the, the, the comments that uh, our discussion also sort of, we, we got through about half a question. Um, mm -hmm. The discussion ended up being um, uh, around how we experience God's love in our lives. And um, it just sort of came to me that, that we, we're so caught up in our lives and our world focusing on the immediate and people have one year plans and we're going to roll this out in the next six months and you at the beginning of the year make your plans for the year and that's the kind of time frame we think in um, and we need to remember that God is working with us for our whole lives um, mm. and he's not going to be finished with us by the end of this year and then go on to phase b of the project next year it's an ongoing project that just goes on and on and on and it's not even a lifetime because god's god's perspective and god's framework um is eternity and so sometimes um we will keep struggling and, and keep uh, uh working on issues for our whole lives there'll be some issues we may well get on top of and we may sort out and get um dealt with um soon and easily other issues will struggle with our entire lives. We will see some things come together at some point and others we will reach the end of our lives and it'll look like things are still not sorted out. Um, but God isn't working in us here for now. He's fitting us for heaven to live with him there. Mm. Um, and that's, that's his perspective. And so that's useful to just have in mind as we think of God's love. It's an eternal love. And it's a love for eternity. So let us end with a prayer. Uh, Lord God, I pray that as we go into the rest of our week, as we go into our communities, as we go into our lives, that we would know that we are loved, we are held, um, we are treasured, and that you are working for our good and for your glory. And so, Lord, help us to, to trust in you, particularly when it's not easy to do, particularly when it doesn't seem clear and obvious. Lord, we pray that your love would fill us at those times, and that as we walk faithfully with you, um, it would be noted, and people would be able to see your love shining through us, day by day. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for our, our groups and the family of believers we share it with. And we pray for your blessing on us going forward. Amen. Mm -hmm.